Great. Uh, well, good, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to this uh, King's Harvard study group webinar on the China question in UK higher education and research. We have an hour to discuss a very big topic, one that's central to the UK's future as a knowledge economy and to our ability to tackle big global challenges. Um, I'm gonna provide a very quick overview of the report, and then we're gonna hear from two of my co-authors, uh, Jonathan Adams, visiting professor at the Policy Institute, King's College London, and chief scientist at the Institute for Scientific in in Information at Clarivate. Um, we're gonna hear also from Janet Ilieva, founder and director of Education Insight. And then after they've given a few thoughts, we're going to turn to our eminent discussants, uh, John Gerson, former diplomat and visiting professor at the Policy Institute, King's College, London, um, to Sajid Javid, former Chancellor of the Exchequer and Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, and Ed Balls, former Shadow Chancellor and now Professor of Political Economy at King's and also Senior Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And once we've done that, once we've heard from my co-authors and our discussants, we'll go to questions. So why have we written this report and why now? The answer to that is that on its current trajectory, China is set to overtake the US to become both the world's biggest spender on R&D and to become the UK's most significant partner. China has risen up the rankings of the UK's research partners at an extraordinary rate. In less than a decade, it's gone from ninth position to second position in 2019, and is now challenging the US for the number one spot. The thesis of our report is that the UK urgently needs to put in place a framework for this key relationship so that it's better able to withstand what could be rising geopolitical tensions in the months and years ahead, and that failure to do so would potentially risk real damage to our knowledge economy. I and my co-authors believe that the UK needs to do a better job of measuring, managing, and mitigating risks that are at present poorly understood and poorly monitored. This is a, a key relationship for us uh, as the UK. It's not imp only important for us uh, as, a, as a knowledge economy, but it's also important to our ability to confront global challenges, to work with China, to tackle questions such as climate change, uh, threats to biodiversity, and the threats that we've just been facing over the last year and a half in terms of new viruses and pandemics. The relationship that our universities and our research community has is a part of a much bigger question, which is how the UK engages with a country that's clearly not a typical partner for us. It's not, not a Western liberal democracy like the US, currently our biggest collaborative partner in research. And it is in some ways extraordinary that our quintessentially liberal institutions, our, our universities are so dependent in a number of key ways on what is an authoritarian uh, regime, almost a neo-totalitarian neo technology power for the financial health and research output of its universities. Unscrutinized and unexamined, this dependency could be a real point of vulnerability for us. The report we've published this week aims to examine these different dependencies that have developed on China in a rather unexamined and unstrategic way over the last 20 years. And we, we, we put forward a few ideas for how this framework to better manage the relationship uh, could work. And we do so in the spirit of strongly believing that the kind of tendency to answer the China question in a binary way, as if there is no possible middle ground between naive and embrace on the one hand and defiant disengagement and decoupling is unlikely to be in the national interest. China is simultaneously across 
different policy areas, a cooperation partner with which the UK has closely aligned objectives, a negotiating partner with which the UK needs to find a balance of interests, an economic partner in the pursuit of technological leadership, and a systemic ri rival promoting alternative models of government, governance, and one that's on occasion responsible for violations of human rights, sometimes on a massive scale. Now this requires a flexible and pragmatic whole of government approach, enabling a principled defense of our interests and values. And managing the UK higher education systems relationship will require a carefully calibrated policy mix so that our HE system can continue to benefit from the opportunities for collaboration that are certainly there. So that's a little overview from me about why we've um, undertaken this report. I'm now gonna to turn to Jonathan Adams, um, chief scientist at Clarivate, um, to give a sense of the, the incredible changes that we've seen and the depth of the relationship that's developed um, on the research side. Jonathan. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, the context in which we should be looking at this is the overall change in the global research system over the last few decades. So 40 years ago, there was very low level of international collaboration, but increasingly cheap jet travel and the internet have changed that. So that the UK has gone from about 5% of its papers being internationally co-authored to something like 65 to 70%. And that includes all of our leading research institutions. So it's a very highly collaborative network. And in that, China has grown from having very few external published papers, uh, being primarily an internally focused uh, economy, which was supporting uh, heavy industry, to one which is increasingly engaged in a wide range of research um, and publishing that in leading journals and engaging with other countries. So that now approaching a quarter of the world's uh, significant research output every year is coming from China. The data on this are extracted from the Web of Science, which covers about 20,000 or so of the world's leading research journals. Um, so we're sampling a significant part of, of research output, but we're not here looking at all of the Chinese language journals, uh, which we don't have access to. Uh, what's happened within this is that the uh, UK-China collaboration has gone from around about 100 papers a year in 1990 to uh, almost 20,000 papers in 2020, and that made up about 12% of the UK's output, an average of 8.5% over the last five years, so clearly still on a significant upwards trajectory. That makes China a bigger partner for us now than Germany. Um, the US is still ahead at 16%, but as Joe says, uh, we're going to see our partnership with China approaching that in the near future. And to put it in another context, that's about the same number of papers as Scotland produced in 2020. So it's a very significant part of the US, of the UK research base. The UK's collaboration with China is very concentrated. It is not spread evenly across all subject areas. That's partly because the Chinese research base itself is very concentrated. It's very focused on technology subjects, on physical sciences. It's growing rapidly in the area of biosciences, but that's still a relatively small part of this huge research base. So not surprisingly, a lot of the UK-China collaboration is in technology areas. And in some of those areas that now accounts for more than 20% and sometimes over 30% of UK papers, UK total papers have a Chinese co-author on around about a quarter to a third of key technology areas. Uh, the benefits of that are very significant. That means that the UK is able to engage in an area in which another country is making a massive investment so we have access to part of that activity. And when we look at the quality of that research, we see that whereas a few years ago, China might have been identified as producing a great deal of mediocre work, now China is increasingly producing very high quality work. And the UK-China papers 
have about twice the number of citations, that's references from subsequent literature, that the UK's core activity has. So there's a very significant benefit in terms of access to IP, and there's a very significant benefit in terms of the quality of the work that's being produced by this relationship. The benefits also come through training, um, and I think Janet will refer to that in more detail. So there's a wider benefit to the younger research force, uh, re research force and their development. Uh, so it spreads broadly across institutions. One reason why the UK may be particularly engaged on the uh, technology area is also that our biosciences are already very highly internationally collaborative. So our leading research groups are already very fully occupied in their relationships with well-established economies in uh, North America and elsewhere in Europe and in, in Australia. The engineers, by comparison, have been less collaborative in the past and have more capacity. And of course, they're far more aware of the potential of what's going on in China. And that gives them uh, a very sound reason for wanting to engage with Chinese research. So there's a lot of potential here. There's a huge rise in activity um, and that offers us potentially many, many benefits for the future. I'll stop there, Joe. Great, thank you very much, Jonathan, that's terrific. Um, Janet, would you give an overview of the international student side of the story and the risks that arise and the benefits that have, arri that have arisen from, from uh, flows into and out of China on the international student side? Yes, of course, thank you, Joe. Um, I will focus on the people-to-people -people links through international student flows and uh, also draw on some of the benefits, uh, not just for the UK higher education, but um, uh, much broader for the UK society and uh, also the economy. Uh, I will start with the obvious fact stating that um, China is home to a fifth of the world's uh, population. And we have more than a million uh, globally mobile students uh, from uh, China alone. Uh, the UK attracts uh, more than 115,000 full-time uh, students into the UK higher education institution and they represent 24% of the international students uh, in the UK. Uh, this compares to just uh, to compare to other uh, peer countries to the UK such as the US and Australia. 34% uh, of the international students in the USA are from China and 32% of the total uh, student, international student body in Canada and uh, Australia uh, are from China. It's uh, also important to state that the majority of the Chinese students are funded by their families. Um, analysis of the uh, UK Higher Education Statistics Agency uh, shows that 86 percent data shows that 86 percent of the students from China are funded by their families and a further 10 percent are on institutional tuition fee waivers however however they're distributed quite unevenly um, along, uh, across the UK levels of study uh, the majority of the students are in postgraduate uh, courses uh, four percent only of the first degree entrance to the UK are from China uh, the highest concentration is uh, master's programs, where 28% of the student body, the overall student body, uh, is uh, from China, and 10% of the entrance to doctoral degrees uh, are from China. It's interesting to look at the demographics of this, uh, the subject demographics of the students. Um, there, there has been, uh, I guess, misconception that uh, Chinese students crowd out uh, UK students. Uh, however, if we look at the courses that they study, um, it's obvious that in many instances, um, demand from China maintains the viability of many of the master's programs uh, in the UK. Uh, example is, um, for instance, uh, looking at the master's students in mathematical sciences, 40% of those students are from China, uh, compared to 27% of the UK students. Uh, similarly, 41% of the 
business students uh, are from China compared to 17% of the UK students. Um, engineering is another uh, subject area with high concentration of uh, students from China, where we have 34% uh, of the overall body being Chinese students, again, compared to 21% of UK students. Uh, talking more broadly about the benefits of having those students um, in the UK higher education institution, they're highly motivated and um, they're also uh, high achievers. Just looking at the non-continuation rates of students, Chinese students have perhaps the lowest non-continuation rate in the UK, 2% only of the Chinese bachelor students um, uh, drop uh, from between year one and year two of their um, bachelor's degrees and this compares 7% to the UK students, uh, for instance. They are highly satisfied with uh, their studies, which is, of course, very positive. 89% of the Chinese students are satisfied with their academic experience uh, in the UK, um, drawing on the um, National Student Survey uh, data. And this compares to 82% of the UK students uh, that um, report high satisfaction with uh, their degrees. It's um, also, I would like to draw on the broader contribution that Chinese students make to the economy. If we draw on the findings um, or on the results reported by the Department for Education and to the estimated value of um, UK education exports, and this includes higher education, um, students in boarding schools, independent schools, English language training and to transnational education, or this is UK education delivered overseas. Um, we'll see that if we map the UK education exports against services exports reported by the Office of National Statistics, then education is the UK's largest services export. And um, I can't state the importance uh, of that uh, enough here. China is the largest sending country um, for international students and as such it has a significant share in uh, the UK uh, exports agenda. Uh, my estimates show that uh, HE exports uh, to China are in the realm of 3.7 billion. This is higher education, full-time students only. So it's a significant, significant underestimate of the true value. Uh, however, I would like to caveat that findings um, in, in the space that the UK is a high cost country and as such more than half of the education export value that I mentioned is basically students' expenditures, expenses towards the cost of living. And the other half or less than half is actually a tuition fees. Uh, so it's not just the higher education sector or, or the education sector as a whole that benefits from hosting Chinese students. It's um, the wider economy is uh, benefiting as such. Uh, I would also like to draw on the soft power um, that um, the UK uh, enjoys and uh, higher education and education is right at the center of the UK soft power. Um, I will draw on the research uh, by the Higher Education Policy Institute that uh, last year found that 59 leaders uh, across the world were educated in the UK and that is second to the US uh, only. Uh, similarly, uh, a study by Ipsos Mori for the British Council found out that uh, in terms of soft power perceptions, the UK is seen to be the second most trusted country in the world um, with um, uh, Chinese um, youth, uh, with 81% of them reporting trust uh, in the country. In the context of a rising geopolitical turbulence, I think this is a significant achievement and um, something that um, I, I, I think we should hold very, very dearly to. I think that um, the lack of understanding um, of uh, the complex engagement of China uh, in a way presents uh, a significant risk. Obviously, there are risks inherent to any global engagement uh, that uh, the UK has with um, other nations and we need to have a fairly forensic uh, approach uh, in understanding the levels of risks across the different uh, types of engagement. Uh, but uh, increasingly, um, I think that students are being caught up in geopolitical tussle that may have little relevance to the students' personal circumstances. 
I, I shall stop here and possibly um, elaborate on some of the further report findings in the in the Q&A session. Thanks, Janet. That's fantastic. Um, we're now going to go to John, John Gerson. John, you advised uh, Mrs. Thatcher for many years. You've been watching China for since the 60s. How, how do you think China looks at the UK university and research relationship? Uh, well, first a word about how I think we should we should approach the subject very, very briefly. That is with humility. Uh, because after all, the risk is partly what I'd call the Tiger Woods trap. People who go to sleep at the wheel and then wake up to find themselves speeding down the wrong lane are prone to swerve right off the road and smash into a tree. And as this report shares, really, failure to see what was in front of our noses mustn't produce a damaging overreaction. As for the Chinese, I think there are four fundamental factors as they would put it. First, fear. In 1919 and 1989, student demonstrations rocked the government. Students and foreign study played crucial roles in the revolutionary movements of the 20th century in China. Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping studied in France. Tokyo and Moscow were incubus, the incubators for revolution. And Beijing is determined that that's not going to happen again. So they keep a very close, some would say sinister, more than sinister, bullying interest in their students. Next, espionage. The Chinese intelligence services and military see foreign universities as repositories of information that it is their duty to steal. And um, of people they might wish to recruit as secret agents. So they use cyber attacks and academic exchanges to further those aims. This is well hidden, but there's publicly available evidence from the US and Europe, and even the China-friendly Russians recently arrested one of their scientists who'd apparently been recruited as a spy by the Chinese Ministry of State Security using the cover of the Dalian Maritime University. I doubt we have been enjoying immunity. Then there's very large scale amateur espionage. Chinese universities and other organizations are also stealing intellectual property in pursuit of their particular interests through their staff abroad and through inviting foreign scholars. This is less well hidden. And there is a great deal of publicly available evidence of it, particularly from the US. These three factors are, of course, the dark sides of respectable impulses. We can't condemn China for wishing to care for their scholars abroad or aiding their development by acquiring foreign knowledge and training their people, nor for seeking to extend their influence abroad. But we surely need to notice and act when it uses unacceptable damaging methods. The fourth fundamental factor is a sincere, delightful, mutually beneficial enthusiasm for shared scholarly endeavor. We're right to embrace it and to reject it would surely be an act of grievous self-harm. Lastly, I'd like to add, or try to, a little flesh to the report's excellent recommendations. One, Let's not forget the humanities. Two, there's strength and safety in numbers. A university that thought it risked Chinese hostility by publishing research on, say, the true history of Chinese sovereignty over Xinjiang, or causing offense by looking at Chinese donation in the mouth, would be protected 
by membership of a sectoral, national, or better still, international body. that required its members to observe certain norms. And if they included strong due diligence and rigorous commonly designed pre before partnerships with non-members, Chinese or from anyone, could be agreed, some of the risks would be more manageable with little scope for Chinese retaliation. And finally, we surely do need to send more of our people to China's centers of current and future excellence. Great, thank you very much, John. Fascinating insights. Okay, we're now gonna to turn to our two other discussants and we're gonna start with Sajid. Sajid, how do you see things from, from your side? Thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks for inviting me to discuss this excellent uh, landmark report. I think, first of all, if I just start my remarks, just sort of stepping back a bit and setting in the context of uh, global Britain. You know, where's, where's Britain heading more broadly and what does it mean for uh, this uh, important relationship? And it's something actually later that, you know, Ed is, is separately done lots of work on. Uh, but uh, it's it, you know, global, but when, when Britain was uh, going for the Brexit referendum, you know, after the referendum result, there were some that had a concern uh, that it might become inward looking, not want to engage with the rest of the world. And thankfully, that absolutely has not turned out to be the case at all. If, if anything, uh, it's the opposite about Britain wanting to engage much more uh, with the world, whether that's through trade and commerce, through uh, talent, uh, trying to deal with global problems and all of that. And so that's important because you know if you are going to engage with the world, you absolutely need to engage with China, uh, no matter what you think about its government and the, and the way, Joe, that you described it as an authoritarian, you know, totalitarian uh, government, um, uh, anti-democratic in every single way possible, that uh, we still have to engage with it, not least because it's soon going to be the world's largest economy, it's the world's largest country uh, already in terms of population. And uh, so many of the global challenges that we have from climate change to biodiversity, to arms control, to future pandemics, if not even this pandemic, we cannot solve them as a world or even begin to without having China's involvement. So I think, you, Joe, you said it in the report, but it's so true. It's worth emphasizing is that no matter what we think, you can't decouple yourself from China. You know, we share the same planet. We're going to have to work with the Chinese uh, government. Now, the, the history of the UK government engagement in recent times is that if you look back to when I first joined the government with David Cameron as prime minister, that, you know, he under some, he tried to take an approach and so did other uh, Western democracies of trying to open up a bit more, trying to do more business. Presidency uh, came to the UK. I remember meeting him as business secretary and uh, he went to a pub and had a pint in Birmingham and all, all, you know, all sorts of things to trying to build that relationship. And, uh, and, and, and that was, a, it was, an, it was an effort with, with good intentions to, to try and see if we can try and draw China in more in a good way. And hopefully they can then start to maybe value democracy and understand democracy a bit more. They might change internally. It clearly it did work. And, uh, and what's changed since then? And that is why the governments, the UK government, along with other governments, has had no choice but to change its own attitude, both under Theresa May and now under Boris Johnson, is rightly they recognize China has, has changed and it's changed in a way uh, which is sadly uh, not good. Uh, I don't think it's good for the Chinese people, but it's certainly not good for us or for countries that love uh, freedom. And the, and the biggest change is, you know, number one, uh, the increase in hostile state activity, something that John has just uh, 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 talked about. And I, you know, I can say certainly as a former home secretary, yeah, there's a lot that I know and a lot that is some of it's out there publicly, some of it isn't, but there's definitely a step change in its hostile state activity. John's given some very good examples uh, of that. Uh, the suppression in Hong Kong, the complete violation of the Sino-British Treaty and the treatment of uh, Hong Kong residents, and, and especially given what we've just seen in the last couple of weeks, the, the mass incarceration and, and, and the murder of uh, the Uyghur population, the, the concentration camps and things, that is all, uh, all at a all different level than ever before. The uh, aggressive uh, assertion of sovereignty China has, particularly in the South China Sea. And then, of course, the uh, most recently, just the pandemic 
thing that has changed the dynamic as well. Not so much, you know, no one sort of, you can't, it's not like blaming China for the pandemic. The point is, how did they behave and react, you know, post the, the discovery of the pandemic and things? And, and it's clear they could have done a lot more to play a constructive role in helping the world trying to deal with this pandemic, but they chose uh, not to. So that's the reality on the ground. We, we both sort of have problems, as it were, with, with China and its approach to so many things. Uh, but at the same time, we have to uh, engage with it, which then brings me back to this report. I think where the report has landed uh, on all this is, is, is absolutely the right place about talking about the importance of this relationship, but you know, the, the mitigating of it. And I'll, I'll get to that, one of the aspects of that, that I think is the most important, but measuring it, understanding it much better already. Some of the, the stats that have been shared about how that relationship is deepened is, I think, is incredibly useful. We're really shine a light. Uh, on this, but having more transparency around the measurement as well. You know, which universities are getting donations, for example, from Chinese-linked uh, uh, entities or individuals, um, and, and all of that. But also, how do we, you know, most of all, how do we manage that going forward? Because we can't disengage from it. There's a lot of valuable research uh, that can help us, and mankind more broadly, whether it's into science and um, uh, risks to the planet and all of that. So uh, you know, uh, we've got to find a way to continue some of this research, but you're know, taking into account what the report said. My final point was just going to see, I think looking at the report, one of the most important things it, it gets into is the, what is point, the, 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 the financial, uh, the fragility of some aspects of our university sector. I mean, some universities, they've got great endowments and they've been around a very long time and you know, they've got other sources of finance, but most of the university sector uh, does not, and it's quite uh, fragile, and and that financial resilience, and it's become so dependent on Chinese students. And Janet shared with us some four billion of revenue, roughly out of twenty eight billion or so of of total uh, uh, exports, as it were, of higher education. That's huge, more than any other country. The universities are reliant on that, and and if we're really going to properly deal with this, I think that has to be at the top of it. How do you change that? It's not going to be easy, but in doing so, we also have to recognize some of the other pressures around universities. Just recently, you know, the even things like the changes in the, in the interest rates and what that's doing for their pension plans, and, the, and you know, that's all putting massive pressure on universities. And I think part of the answer has to be around you know, financial resilience and how uh, that can be tackled. Super. Thank you very much, Sajid. Um, Ed, turning to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, it's not often that, um, that you read a paper which totally brings you up short, and uh, this one did for me. I think probably like many people, I knew about the huge increase in international students over the past decade, but the, sc the scale and the speed with, with which that's happened, the focus on China, as Sajid said, the multi-billion financial exposure, that did take me by surprise, and it, um, it made me think um, back to being a minister. And I'm sure the same thing is true, Joe, for a university vice chancellors as well. There are different kinds of mistakes that you can make. There are the mistakes where you are totally blindsided by an event which you just couldn't foresee. Then there are the kind of, a, of mistakes where there's an issue, you have a nagging doubt. It never actually crystallizes as an issue until the crisis. And then you kick yourself that you should have known. And then there's a third type where the problem is stark and right there in your face and you choose to, um, to ignore it and to take a Panglossian view. And it seems to me on the basis of this paper that um, the issues here are firmly in the third category, um, that it's time to take off the rose-tinted spectacles. Now, I'm not, I don't think any of us are here. I'm not a China skeptic. I'm the son of a scientist who throughout his career had strong links with researchers across the non-democratic world. I've got the stamp collection to prove it. Over my career at the Treasury, as China emerged into the global economy, I was and still remain firmly in the engagement camp. There are so many economic opportunities for, for Britain, for our economy, our universities, but that economic opportunity for the UK is matched, in my view, by a moral obligation to the many millions of Chinese who still live in, in hardship and need that external economic relationship. But as we've heard, the policy environment has got much tougher. China's clearly become more assertive and aggressive in recent years, matched by a more confrontational US. 
which might modify, but isn't going to fundamentally change with a Democrat Congress. The same pressures are here in the UK Parliament, growing pressures, which together explain the government's about, uh, about turn on Huawei. And as Sajid hinted at, outside the EU, a new global Britain, this new vision, is going to mean the UK is going to be under greater pressure across many areas, including the Chinese relationship. The US is going to be looking for allies. There's no EU policy position to hide behind. And I totally applaud the government attitude to Hong Kong residents and new visas. I abhor China blocking the BBC. But if global Britain is going to be a champion of human rights and liberalism, then more conflict is inevitable. So it feels like it's a much tougher environment and it's going to get tougher. And the question then is, what does that mean for the, um, the issues you raise in the report for research, but particularly as well for students and for universities? I totally agree with the paper's overall conclusion that we have to stay engaged. As, a result, uh, as the report says, with a middle way between naive embrace and defiant disengagement. Joe, I've always been in favour of third ways and a new middle way here feels like a good idea to me. I agree too it's going to need action from government and universities. I wonder whether in a couple of areas it's going to need to go further than the paper's conclusions. First of all, on sensitive research and wider academic freedom, it seems to me we're going to need to codify to get to an understanding with China about what is and isn't acceptable in the bilateral relationship. One way to do that is through um, a, a UK-China free trade agreement, if and when that comes along. Maybe over time through, th through CPTPP, if Britain and China end up in that, um, in that relationship. But it's going to have to go beyond expressions of mutual collaboration. I would think it's going to have to draw where the boundary is over which deep collaborative research with China becomes difficult or impossible. And also the rules of the game in study and in research, and in research especially for Chinese students doing remote uh, learning and the issues of academic freedom which arises there. So I wonder whether that's not going to be a, quite a tough negotiation. Second, the government clearly sees global Britain as an opportunity for greater economic diversity. Maybe in the government's mind, that's from the EU, but the paper suggests it's going to need to be diversity from China as well. In strategic research in student numbers, the trends are very strong and very clear as you set out. And if we're going to build a successful high-tech future for our country with global relationships and retain skilled labour, there may need to be more diversity, a strategy for greater diversity. And then the third point, if there's a case for active government-led research diversification, then the same thing seems to me applies to university students. We've heard how exposed UK universities are now to um, Chinese students and fee income into the multi-billions of pounds. A swing in the public policy environment, whether that's UK or China, or UK US driven can't be ruled out. And clearly that could become very quickly, very financially challenging for our universities. And I think I agree with the authors that it's not for the government to set caps on student numbers from particular countries. But I think if that's right, then the quid pro quo is that universities are not going to be able to expect any government financial bailout if that bilateral relationship suddenly deteriorates. We had a warning shot this year with the pandemic. So far, its potential financial impact on the universities because of international student numbers seems to, to have held up. But I guess my advice to university leaders would be not to draw the wrong conclusions. A similar non-pandemic shock in the future in the UK-China relationship could have very different outcomes it seems to me that now is the time for universities to actively seek to diversity, to diversify. As I said, there are three types of mistakes that you can make, and this is no time for rose-tinted spectacles. Thank you. That's brilliant, Ed. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to throw that challenge to Janet. Janet, can you give an assessment of the extent to which universities are putting in place diversification strategies on the international student side. 
I think this one is really difficult and um, I can't possibly imagine a harder time to diversify. And I'm saying that in the context of um, the UK having just left the EU and the consequences of that on diversity. Um, London Economics uh, projects a 57% decline in EU student numbers to the UK. So with that in mind, even if there is no change in the number of students from China, their proportion will increase. And so would the reliance on students from China simply because there'll be fewer EU students. Um, I mean, the kind of the obvious gap in the UK's international education strategy is a lack of proactive engagement with the EU. But these students having just le uh, lost access to the uh, finance, um, they need visas to study in the UK and I suspect uh, price sensitive um, EU students will be massively impacted. So in terms of diversification, I think that puts huge pressure on the universities um, to, to recruit students. And China is um, the far biggest country, uh, source country for such students. However, what works in the UK's favor, and again, it comes from the uh, international education strategy and the introduction of post-study work visas uh, for uh, students, um, this will revitalize again, uh, especially demand from South Asia and uh, countries where UK lost huge ground when uh, post-study work opportunities were restricted in 2012. So I'm talking, we are already seeing India rebounding uh, in big way, uh, but also I expect other countries, uh, South Asia, uh, also Nigeria, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, many countries identified in the international education strategy. Uh, I expect a significant increase in student demand. So thankfully, uh, the UK post-study work rights are back. Uh, that will help and support uh, diversification. It's a huge benefit. I think that is at the moment, which is probably the only positive factor that is kind of playing to um, mitigate um, uh, declines in um, uh, EU recruitment. But the environment is extremely challenging. It's very, very difficult. So Brexit is a huge, um, uh, I guess, a constraint. On the other hand, the world is emerging from a post-pandemic recession. And um, Talking about international students, these are um, the top of the world middle class families sending their kids abroad to educate them. The middle class is, um, uh, will shrink on the back of the pandemic and uh, any recession, and that will impact a student's ability to fund their studies. Um, so it's a constraint, we have to work. But on the other hand, again, um, what I have seen um, uh, in terms of uh, UK resilience, uh, uh, higher education provision is uh, universities managed to diversify and tutorize pathways from offshore through transnational education, through partnerships that will continue to bring students to study in the UK, even for shorter periods of time, simply because through online, through uh, transnational education and other means, universities continue to engage with students based in their home country. So I'm seeing this happening more and more. And I believe part of this attempt to diversify will basically be built on significant infrastructure built by the UK higher education sector overseas in students' home countries. It's very complex. Thanks, Janet. That's terrific. And just to say that one of the recommendations of the report was that the Office for Students, which already has a duty to have regard to the financial sustainability of the sector, should actively require institutions to have diversification strategies. So they're not over dependent on income from one particular country. Um, Sajid, I wanted to turn to, to you just to give a feel for some of the domestic political pressures influencing China policy in parliament. It seems that there's been something of a tipping point in terms of parliamentary attitudes on the China question. And for me, the tipping point has been around the Uyghurs, which has just concentrated minds and made people really yep. reflect again on the nature of the relationship with China. How do you read the mood on conservative benches at the moment? And how would you advise the government to deal with these sort of these pressure groups that are arising on conservative benches, such as the China Research Group, 
and others and others like it. Well, the, thanks, Joe. I think the reason we're seeing these you know, pressure groups, whether it's the China Research Group and uh, through APBGs and in other ways, is because uh, uh, there is real genuine concern amongst uh, parliamentarians, and I would certainly say it's it's not just the, the those in the governing party. I mean, so if you look at the uh, the, the attitude of the opposition to some of these challenges is actually not that dissimilar from where the, the government is, especially on the, on the issues around Uyghurs and Huawei and 5G and all that uh, as well. So this is, this reflects genuine concern because uh, it, it is uh, it, it linked to what I uh, was setting out earlier that you know, China has, you know, it's been the authoritarian dictatorship you know, ever since their revolution, but it, what's changed in the last few years, uh, in the last decade, is that it, under presidency, it's moved more and more in that direction. But the suppression of the Uyghurs, uh, the mass concentration camps and stuff, you know, this is happening. It's real. It's not fake news. This is real. And uh, the parliamentarians will react. And, and through that lens, then much of the rest of the debate around China, when you throw in what's happening to Hong Kong and the suppression of the people in Hong Kong, the security threats, uh, that is the lens through which uh, Parliament will make these decisions. And that's not going to change. And it, and it shouldn't change in that you know, this is what really what China is doing, which then brings us back to the conversation that we're having and what the report uh, rightly focuses on is that you're know, given all of that, but given at the time, same time that we can't you know, disengage uh, it, 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 in any meaningful way and how it, that could be self-defeating when it comes to research, then we've got to have uh, the kind of strategies uh, that you set out. Uh, can I also just on the, 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 I want to just agree with something, if I quickly, that Janet had said earlier about the importance of soft power uh, here as well. You know, one of the, one of the longer term benefits I do think that comes from having so many uh, Chinese uh, students come and then you know, uh, most of them, as we know, eventually return back to China is that we shouldn't underestimate the value of that soft power. They've, they've come to our country, they've seen what a real democracy is like and how things really work. They take that back home and no matter what the authorities say to them, that can't be taken away from them. And that's huge. And we've seen that at work throughout the world. And that is just in terms of our own long-term benefits that why you know having uh, you know, Chinese students under the right circumstances coming to the UK is beneficial. It's not just about the money. This soft power will pay off massively in the long term. John, can I come to you on the sort of the, the, the way in which the Chinese authorities might instrumentalize these dependencies for political purposes? So in terms of the Chinese-Australia relationship, we've seen some signs that China has sort of turned on and off the tap of student flows via pressure on local education agents steering Chinese students away from Australian institutions. Uh, to ebb and flow in, in light of geopolitical relations with Australia. What would be the sort of tipping points that might prompt Chinese authorities to behave in a similar way with respect to the UK? And do you see any risk that that might happen? Uh, I suppose there's some risk, but if you look closely at the way China punishes uh, countries it, it's crossed with, they're uh, and let's take Australia as an example, uh, where they've got very cross with Australia, but uh, Australian exports to China have risen uh, because they haven't restricted iron ore imports, which they badly need. They've punished them by going for wine and things they don't need. And the same would apply with students. They would feel constrained from uh, getting more than cross and doing something like restricting the flow of students if, um, if they felt they were damaging their own interests. It, that's, that's quite clear from the record. Great, okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Um, Ed, just touching on some of the points that Sajid was just making around mood in parliament. In the, in the US, China has been something of a bipartisan issue across the, across the House in the States. How do you assess mood within the, the sort of the Labour Party and other, other parts of the political system in the UK? Is, do you feel that there's the same sort of bipartisan approach towards China and these questions that we're seeing in the States here in the UK? 
Well, Sanjid would be much closer to it uh, than than me, but uh, I do think that uh, when we talk about the Uyghurs or Huawei or more generally um, uh, Hong Kong, it has been um, bipartisan. And I was reading the um, uh, the a report of the the China Research Group just from a few weeks ago, which had Labour and Conservative politicians at the same event making very similar points. Um, of course, I think Keir Starmer is being cautious because the history suggests it's very easy for Labour to um, to wholeheartedly embrace a very ethical a foreign policy in opposition. But in, in government, that's more challenging when you start to come up against uh, jobs and industries. For Labour after 1997, that was defence jobs. Um, it may be um, in the coming years, it's going to be to, to be university jobs um, uh, as much on the basis of, uh, of this report. But I guess the other thing is that, um, the other bipartisan element is that both parties are still very slowly coming to terms with the new reality of um, Britain's place in the world. I think if it hadn't been for the pandemic, there would have been a lot more debate on this over the last uh, year. Uh, and there's a little bit of fatigue with the, the deal finally being agreed with the EU, but we are suddenly in a very different uh, environment um, where we um, we can't simply stand with the the the, the EU um, if we are to um, to have common positions with clout we have to to build alliances and um, and there are economic costs as well as um, kind of influence costs to trying to go it alone and I'm not sure yet whether either. Um, leadership in either party has worked out the right balance between a sort of uh, a Britain as global liberal democratic leader and Britain as pragmatic um, economically driven alliance builder and um, I would think that uh, both Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer will look at some of the debates which go on in the on the backbenches um, and the pressures to to pull away from the relationship and both feel that you know in the real world they're going to have to 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 navigate now um that's easy but actually quite um quite quite damaging and that the right thing to do is to build build alliances to apply pressure but that is just it's harder for us now it's a new challenge so i'm not sure whether bipartisan wise either party quite knows how to approach this relationship where we are now, you know, compared to China, a much, much smaller player. Got it. Ed, you said at the start that this report had sort of stopped you in your tracks. And actually, as one of the authors of it, that I, I had the same sensation. And I felt, um, having been science minister, you know, under three prime ministers, I felt, you know, frankly appalled that so much of the findings of this report were a total surprise to me particularly the scale mm. of the relationship on the research side and the extent to which such high proportions of our research in key areas um, were dependent on collaboration and partnership with China. I should have known, I really should have known that mm. in key areas like telecommunications, material science, and so on, those sort of key, very big fields um, have you know, proportions of our output in excess of 30% in collaboration with China. It's just, it's a, it's a fundamental dependency. And if ministers like me weren't aware of it, we certainly should have been. And I accept full responsibility, you know, for my failures in, in not knowing. But boy, boy, ministers should be aware of that. Um, Jonathan, you were responsible for these findings. And thanks to the work of Clarivate, you know, they're now getting, you know, a wider, a wider area. We can now see, thanks to the research that you've pulled together, that UK collaborations with China are on track to becoming our most significant bilateral partnership. When do you think China, or if, when do you think China will overtake the US as our number one research partner? Is that an, an inevitable development? In our report, we make a number of recommendations around ways in which we should manage such a development. And one of the striking uh, suggestions is that it's got to be a much more transparent and two-way flow of knowledge 
supported by much more reciprocal access based on much more regular partnership visits by UK scientists to Chinese labs and schemes with enhanced incentives to place UK researchers in China. So we've got more line of sight into what's going on in this vast research economy in China. In the last few minutes, might you just elaborate a little bit on that idea and that whole issue? <laughs> well, thanks very much, Joe. Yes, and I wanted to pick up on, on just that because John referred to it when he was uh, speaking earlier on. And I think that this is essential um, and it's not the, the first time we've drawn attention to this, um, that if, if, if the, the West wants to understand what's going on in China, then we need to send people to China and they need to work there and spend time there. And if we want to get a really good sight of uh, the way in which Chinese do research, because it's not, it's not just what's being published. I and mean, there are other aspects of the, the research relationship. It's, it's how do you define the problems you want to solve? How do you determine what your priorities are? And, and, and what, why do you decide to go down some paths and not other paths? And the Chinese may well have different approaches to this in their thinking about what they want to invest in, work in, and how they're training people. But we have very little sight on that. And so we need to have people who are working at the lab bench in China as well as having Chinese researchers working at the lab bench here in the UK. But I think everybody on this call will know that our language skills training has been absolutely appalling over the years. Uh, we haven't had a very good record on mobility of, of, of students and researchers, even within Europe. Uh, we've done very well out of EU framework programmes, but actually getting people to go and work in labs in other countries has been more problematic. So we absolutely have to get the research workforce mobilized to think in terms of going to China, as well as just being a recipient of Chinese funding and Chinese pair of hands to work at the, 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 the lab bench here in the UK. And that's the way in which we will build up a, a mutually strong relationship and understand what's going on. But just to go back to, you know, do we need this relationship? 20 years ago, we were publishing about the same volume of research in nanotechnology as the Chinese were. China now has a 10 times greater volume of nanotechnology research than us. And the number of papers that we co-author with China is greater than the number of papers that we're publishing domestically that are purely UK. You know, the, as you said, Joe, these are key areas. These are economically essential areas if we want to be competitive. And China has got a huge amount of research activity and IP. Now, it's one of the truisms that I'm so sure Said will be more well aware of. Research is expensive. Great research is very expensive and world-class research is more than anybody can afford. So where we share costs with partners around the place, we have an opportunity to gain and to get into areas that we otherwise cannot afford to invest in, but we absolutely have to invest in. So I think, yes, get people to go to China, uh, get people trained up in speaking the language, understanding what's going on and understanding the approach taken by Chinese researchers so that we can improve the dialogue that we're having with them. And just, just to go back to the one aspect of my question, China is currently in second position with about 11% of all, 12% of our collaborations. The US represents about 19% of our international collaborations. When is, when is there going to be a, a moment of overtaking, Jonathan, according to your... According well, to your... <laughs> the, 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 the other thing that we need to throw into the equation there is that actually the, uh, the US has been going through a rather declining period of investment in, in research as uh, a share of global activity. So, so it, it's probably trending downwards slightly. I think in another decade, we're likely to see China as, as our, our primary partner. And, and we need to have a great relationship if we're going to do that. Terrific. Well, that's a positive, positive note to, to end on. I want to thank all of our discussants and my fellow co-authors very much for your time. And thank you, everybody. I think that brings our hour to a close. Thanks. Thank you.